Today, the Chinese martial arts are often ridiculed for their combat inefficiency and their dance-like movements. But what if I told you that it wasn't always the case and that the changes which you see today were actually, well, pretty recent as the styles are recreated and, well, reimagined in the last 60 years or so? Currently, I have dedicated around 17 years of my life to the Chinese martial arts, and this research has started out of something very small, mostly my personal interest and the love of history, but eventually grew into something very big and became sort of an obsession of mine. So I would like to share with you the results of this research and in the end share my opinion. The new policies implemented in the creation of modern Ushu has created a generation of dancers who wiggle their flappy swords, punch the air and imagine that they are unstoppable killing machines. And full disclosure, I was a victim of this too. Practicing Ushu, I also participated in the Taolu and felt quite satisfied with myself until I was knocked out by a kickboxer when I was around 18 years old. By then, I was practicing regularly for around 7 years already, yet a kickboxer who just got into training 6 months ago dominated me in the ring rather comfortably. It was my first such experience being under such a pressure, and well, it basically threw all my years of martial arts training out the window. This in turn pushed me to train differently and to search for the real roots of the Chinese martial arts as I knew they were so ancient and for a reason, right? Because in history, well, everything that doesn't work basically perishes. So I had many questions and I was searching relentlessly. Before we talk about China, let's take a brief look into how Asian martial arts developed in the West in our recent history. The Chinese martial arts got extremely popular in America and Europe ever since Bruce Lee introduced them in the 1960s. However, what he introduced were mostly the concepts of Wing Chun taught to him by Ip Man and some Tai Chi Chuan forms that were taught to him by his father. But the Chinese martial arts as a whole are much more vast than that, with literally hundreds of styles and subdivisions of each. And in Bruce Lee's movies, there were constant mentions of the mythical Shaolin Temple, obscure fighting styles and deadly Chinese warriors. This created a legion of fans that were hungry to learn more, which in turn led to the creation of a huge number of fraudulent schools, especially in the West. However, all this has started happening on a massive scale only from the 60s and 70s. Before that, Asian martial arts, except for Judo, were largely unknown in the West. And yes, although Karate and Taekwondo started spreading overseas in the late 1950s, they were still very obscure and didn't enjoy much popularity. But after Bruce Lee has brought the Asian martial arts to the big picture, these arts didn't become mainstream, they become trendy, an object of a great fascination. If you have seen my previous video about the ban and popularity of Asian martial arts in the USSR, you should get the picture. The main difference is that in the West there was no ban and that their popularity has arrived much earlier. The core concepts of this phenomena, though, were the same, with many people wanting to learn more, get acquainted with this mythical tradition, learn secret styles, and to become an unbeatable warrior. Unfortunately, this sudden spike in demand has attracted the attention of charlatans and of people who had only marginal, if any, connection to the actual martial arts. It's like a white belt who has learned a few of the basic kata and drills in his native country would come to the US and open his own dojo. Yes, it was that bad. And for the marketing purposes, he of course would beautify himself as a possessor of a secret style and as a patriarch of some system that goes back hundreds if not thousands of years. Obviously, all this was before the internet, when the information was much harder to find and to verify, and people were generally much more naive back then too. This unfortunately created a fertile soil for charlatans who easily exploited such enthusiasts and misled them for many, many years. This fad of fake masters on a massive scale continued all the way to the early 1990s. However, with time, obviously, it did lead to a massive reputation damage and delusion of martial arts overall, especially during the times of the early UFC that began in the 1993. In those early fights, it quickly became apparent that boxers, kickboxers and wrestlers were dominating all the remaining styles. 
And on top of that, there was no excuse that, oh, but UFC is just a sport and not a real street fight, because back in 1993 and all the way to 1997, all the equipment that the fighters had was basically just the representation of their styles and their personal background. Gloves were optional and most fighters didn't even want to wear them. It had no round system and the fights could have only ended in three ways, with a KO, submission or tossing the towel. So, with most of the Kung Fu, Karate, Taekwondo and the so-called Ninjutsu practitioners being quickly and easily dealt with, many new questions started to arise. Many traditional martial arts masters started to be openly ridiculed, challenged and laughed at. And, to be honest, in most cases it was well deserved, since a large number of them were not masters by any meaning of the word and were leeching on the naive enthusiasts for decades at this point. So from the mid-1990s western view on the martial arts has changed drastically as the reality proved what works and what does not. Now going back to China. The evolution of the martial arts in China happened independently from the West, and although many prominent martial artists were participating in the Chinese Civil War and have left a huge impression regarding their skill and deadliness, many of them were executed and persecuted in the later years. The most prominent example is a Shaolin monk Miao Xing, who was claimed to have received the full Shaolin tradition and was almost worshipped for his skills by the most of other monks. He was meant to become the next head of the Shaolin temple and to lead the monastery through the tough years of war. He, however, had a different idea. He wanted to change the world. This desire to change the world has led him to join one of the local warlords, Wu Peifu. So he took the monks that were loyal to him and joined the ranks of Peifu's army. During the war, he killed a massive number of people. He was particularly proficient with the broadsword Dao and pistol, with the records claiming that he had almost a supernatural marksmanship. Even in those times, many soldiers were skeptical of the actual skills of the Shaolin. As a result, during his growth in the army ranks, he challenged and was challenged many times, and he ended all of his fights with the death of his opponent, showcasing unnecessary cruelty and disdain for the human life. For obvious reasons, he has stopped being challenged rather quickly. The soldiers who shared barracks with him were terrified of his persona, as he often killed people using finger strikes, had an enormous physical strength and speed, and was akin to a bloody hurricane in a close quarters fights using his broadsword. He was also reported to have never used a bed, he always spent the night sitting on a small towel in a meditation pose, creeping out many of the soldiers. With all that violence and cruelty, he has violated some of the most sacred vows of the Shaolin Temple, such as never take the life willingly and to avoid the worldly affairs. Also, unlike his brethren, he believed that the full knowledge of the Shaolin Temple has to be freely shared with the rest of the population. He was teaching the armies of Wu Pei Fu in the most sacred of techniques and started making detailed training manuals, which was completely unheard of at the time, being one of the biggest taboos in the Chinese martial arts culture. He led a wild and a turbulent life until his death in 1933. Wu Pei Fu was reported to have felt uneasy around Miao Xing, and many soldiers started to suspect that he might be afraid of him and his ambitions. The information about such people has reached Mao Zedong as well, as in his circle there were prominent martial arts masters as well, especially among the bodyguards. So, after the defeat of the nationalists, Mao Zedong has started to implement his policies, with his first major one being the Great Leap Forward in 1958, which killed millions of people, with many carriers of old traditions being in their ranks, such as martial artists, poets, monks, etc. But ripping out martial arts from the Chinese culture had been foreseen to be a difficult concept to pull off, so the talks about the reforms regarding Ushu had been going on in the communist China since the very conception of the state in 1949. By the mid-1950s, the government had enough time to reorganize and to recreate Wushu in their image, so in the big festival of 1956, the first introduction of modern Wushu took place. That same year, the All Chinese Wushu Association was established, and the head of this organization was Li Menhua, the son of one of the creators of the Communist China, Li Da Zhao. Due to his influence by 1964, many more styles were added into the catalog, with their Taolo being reworked to be made into something beautiful, reminiscent of artistic gymnastics or a dance. 
By the way, if you're not familiar with Chinese martial arts, Taolu is basically something akin to Kata in the Japanese arts. Basically, it's a type of solo practice reminiscent of shadow boxing. In order to popularize this new sport, the champions of these new Taolo competitions were praised and have started to be treated with respect in the society. However, the Taolo themselves were almost completely stripped of their initial purpose and applications. The sparrings and the fighting were also illegal, so people only could compete strictly in the Taolo department. This in a way disarmed the Chinese martial arts, making them safe to practice for the people of this newly established country. This served two purposes, to play on the people's love for the martial arts to gain further support for the government, and to make something peaceful and harmless out of Wushu, since in the long Chinese history the anti-government revolts led by various sects centered around martial arts took place many times, with various degrees of success, sometimes failing outright, yet sometimes destabilizing the country enough to be vulnerable to the external aggressor. The full contact part of Ushu, called Sanda, also known as Sen Cho, has become a sport only by the late 1980s. Before that, it was reserved for the military training only. I would actually like to make a follow up video talking about the history of Sanda sometime later. Many traditional masters were not impressed by this new Ushu and refused to accept the new rules, as this new Ushu was a mockery on the old traditions and basically corrupted the whole meaning of the art. So these masters continued teaching in their old ways, in their own private schools, much to the wrath of the new government. For a quick comparison, we can take a look at this video right here. This video was taken in Beijing in the 1930s, and we can see a master teaching his student the art of the sword. And as far as we can see, it looks very basic, right? It's, it looks like... It looks natural, that's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't look like some flamboyant dance. This looks more like a technique which a warrior would perform during his free time to get acquainted with the sword, to get the feel for the technique and hopefully use that technique in the drills later on with a sparring partner and eventually, if the need will be, to use it in a combat. And it was not meant to be beautiful. It was meant to be efficient and it had a reason. It had application hidden in the form, you know. It wasn't just, uh, you know, made to score points with the judges or to impress the public with a performance. To cleanse all that, the Cultural Revolution has begun in 1966, which openly persecuted and destroyed Buddhist and Taoist monks, their temples, records and books. Most of the abbots were also executed, and the practitioners of all such arts were sent to the labor camps where most of them perished. The village martial arts schools were also disbanded, with their patriarchs being publicly executed. It is interesting to note that Ip Man, the future teacher of Bruce Lee, foresaw what would happen under the new regime and fled to Hong Kong in the 1950s, as his family was rather rich and influential in the pre-communist times, making him a prime target. Additionally, during the eradication of the Four Olds, all aspects of the traditional culture have started to be suppressed, not only the martial arts, labeling them as harmful artifacts of a regressive era, but indeed the martial arts and the traditional Chinese medicine practitioners were on the top of the list. Chinese traditional medicine has also proved difficult to eradicate, so they repurposed Taiji Chuan and advertised it as the best method for longevity, suitable for all ages, rather than what it was supposed to be. Of course, many martial artists continue to practice in secret, mostly in complete isolation, as taking students has become more risky than ever before. In my opinion, I don't think that 100% uh, well, reliance on the Taolu and solo practice was enough to fully preserve these arts, since without sparring and pressure testing, such things would quickly turn into dance routines, fitness programs and rituals, but maybe that was a plan. In the 1980s, when China finally opened up to the world, it quickly started to spread its cultural influence overseas, promoting their new Ushu, opening schools and inviting foreigners to come to China to finally learn all those secret styles that they have been dreaming about all this time, while watching the Peking opera martial arts in Hong Kong movies and reading countless books about the infamous Di Mak. The Shaolin Temple has also been transformed and repurposed to push this new cultural agenda. I will make a video about what happened to Shaolin as a follow-up to this, as it's quite a vast topic of its own. 
As I said earlier, these policies have created a generation of dancers who wiggle their flappy swords and punch the air like there's no tomorrow, and we can see it today in many examples when these masters who punched the air for so long have finally been challenged by the full contact practitioners, with the results being about what we should expect. And the current Chinese government is trying to protect its creation very actively, publicly ridiculing, taking away the social credit and blaming people such as Xu Xiaodong, and I quote here, for dishonoring Chinese traditional culture and values, while promoting the western crude version of martial arts. Now, is it ironic or what? Tell me guys, what do you think about the traditional Chinese martial arts? Have you ever had a chance to try any of the many styles which are present and currently taught? Kindly let me know in the comments below, the next video will be about the modern Shaolin temple. So until then, remember to stay strong, stay healthy and to never neglect knowledge. Peace out.